Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. The show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week and then it's posted to our website for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our recordings. Both the live show and our archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think who might be interested in any of the topics we have here on the show. Um, uh, for those of you who are not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and that's for all libraries. So you will find things on our program for public libraries, K-12, academics, uh, museums, uh, corrections librarians, anything and everything you'll find on there. Um, and we do a mixture of things here on the show, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, um, demos of services and products that we think they may, may be of interest to uh, librarians. So um, you can find all sorts of things in our show. Um, we do have, uh, sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff do sh presentations, things about services and products we're offering through here. Um, but sometimes we also bring in guest speakers. And today we actually have a mixture of that. <laughs> um, this morning, as you can see on the screen here, we're going to be talking about poetry. Hey. Woo. Yeah, woo. Hey. <laughs> um, and with us, we actually have our newly last year appointed officially a, a, a few months ago. Yeah, months ago. Uh, new state poet Matt Mason. Thank you, Matt, for joining Thanks us for here today. And um, we're going to talk about how we got that position. Um, but also we have um, Erica Hamilton right next to me here, who's the Director of Literary Programs at Humanities Nebraska, uh, the, the organization that uh, runs these. Well, it's a partnership. Partnership, yeah. Um, also on the line remotely with us is Chuck Beek. Good morning, Chuck. He was on the selection committee for uh, the um, state poet, and Brad Modlin, who is the also new, <laughs> newish, Reynolds Chair of Poetry at the University of Nebraska in Kearney. Good morning, Hi, Brad. Hi. And here with me, also farther on down the table, uh, Rod Wagner, who's the director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning. Um, and just a little out of camera range, we don't have a lot of room here, is uh, Tessa Terry, who is our communications coordinator here at the Nebraska Library. Uh, so I think we're going to start with talking about um, the program, the Humanities Nebraska, and I think it's page we got here, and what it's all about. Like, how how do you become the uh, the Nebraska's new uh, state poet? Well, the Nebraska state poet is appointed by the governor, but the selection process and um, the well, the the state poet is supported and selected by a partnership of the Humanities Nebraska and the Nebraska Arts Council and the Nebraska Library Commission. And it's a five-year term right mm -hmm. now. And so our previous state poet was Twyla Hansen. Mm -hmm. she, her, she had the term from um, 2000, um, 2013 to 2018. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and there was no state poet for like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we suffered uh, for a few like weeks that. there. It was <laughs> right. But the process is it started in, the, in January of 2018 where we started mm -hmm. seeking public nominations. Mm -hmm. And um, so people, anyone throughout the state of Nebraska could send us a query asking, I would like this person to be state poet. And then they were invited to submit the nomination packet. We had five poets who were nominated. And then each one had to agree to be nominated because um, we don't want to select a poet who doesn't want to do the work, who doesn't want to spend five years traveling the state. It, it is, yes, it is a long term there, yeah. yeah. But. And um, after we got their materials and the selection committee met and talked about the different, the, the five nominees chose their three finalists. Mm -hmm. And then the finalists came in for an interview process. Oh. Back in, I think it was November, wasn't it? That sounds right. Late October, right. November. Yeah. November. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. uh, when the selection committee decides who they want their, who want, who they want to be state poet, their, their yeah. selection, then they have to forward it to the governor. And then it's a waiting yeah. game. Yeah. And yeah. we waited for a couple <laughs> of months. <laughs> yeah. 
because if that was in November, it wasn't like you said, it wasn't actually made official. And when was the it's January? January. Yeah. 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 All right, and we do have on our page here for um, today's session. The, um, what were the actual guidelines um, <clears throat> for 2018? So this is, is this the kind of information that you send out to people who are potentially wanting to nominate someone? Right. And we had this publicly available. We had press release about this. Anytime we received an email from someone saying, hey, I would like Matt Mason to be the Nebraska State Poet. And then mm -hmm. I would send these guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, what we're looking for, what the nomination should include, the re review criteria. We wanted someone who had published poetry, who had received awards in their field, but who was also um, willing and had experience traveling and working with public audiences to bring poetry throughout the state of Nebraska. Sure, sure. Um, and so this has the, the eligibility criteria on here. Um, and information about how you do it. So this is something that will not happen again for another five years. Another five years. So uh, we'll start the process again in 2023. When when your when your term is wrapping up. So there's yep. yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's an online process. So it's not this is something they would all do online, not right. like hand, sending in a paper ballots or anything no, like that. No, and this is this is part of the partnership with the Nebraska Arts Council. As you can see, we use their slide room. Mm -hmm. Um so even though I'm the coordinator, the staff person, mm -hmm. I'm with Humanities Nebraska, we go through the Nebraska Arts Council's website and then the Nebraska Library Commission provides the space for us to do the interviews. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's how you, so you said you were, you were interviewed, how did that go, was that? Um, uh, it was it was interesting this time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come to a room full of people. It's a great conversation. I read some poems, answer a lot of questions. But it was interesting. I was a finalist five years ago in 2013, uh -huh. and it's like I thought the interview was amazing. Thought it went great, mm -hmm. and and then Twilo was state poet. Uh, <laughs> you just never. <laughs> you never. Had, well, and then this did do great. She. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> Twilo did one. It was a tough decision. It was, no, Twilight's fantastic. There's not a complaint, obviously. But uh, but then this time, you know, I went through the interview and everything, and I was like, oh my god, I didn't say this, I didn't say this, yeah. I answered this horribly. So I was just like, oh whatever. Um, and then and then I get state poet. So the lesson is mess up your interview. <laughs> you improve your chances. It can be too perfect. <laughs> All right, well, we're glad that you were picked up, absolutely. Um, so what are the plans for the next five years? What is your plan oh. for where you see yourself in five years now? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Well, really, over the next five years, I just want to get around the state. Uh, my whole project involves getting into different communities uh, statewide, kind of the... Um, the, the loose benchmark is, can I get to all 93 counties and do a reading or a workshop or some kind of presentation, hopefully bringing in another poet or poets who live there in the community also, just to shine a little bit of light on local poetry especially. Um, but I may not get to all 93 counties. I mean, because when I, my goal is just to get into as many communities as possible. So. Uh, a lot of every county has got multiple communities. I want to get into prisons. I want to get into libraries. I want to get into schools. You know, I want to be on reservations. Whatever different ways of getting out and uh, kind of shining a light on poetry and hopefully raising interest locally, uh, statewide in poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought it was an, a, a, a kind of, I don't know if it was on purpose, but last year's One Book, One Nebraska was poetry anthology. Yeah. And it's kind of, I think it's a nice follow up that we happen to be switching and so uh, having the new state poet be coming like on the heels of that. Yeah. And I wonder if that will. That was one of the things I was thinking about when that, when Nebraska Presence was selected as One Book, yeah. One Nebraska. 
for 2018, I thought, well, that is perfect <laughs> <laughs> because we are trying to get Nebraska poets to be nominated. Yeah. So yeah, that was. I don't know if that was part of the design. It, exactly it was. Planned, it wasn't yeah, planned. It, it just kind of was lucky yeah. coincidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's a great book too. So mm -hmm. happy yeah. to see it there. Absolutely. So, uh, Chuck, we did want to ask you, and I, I almost missed this, um, you were involved in the selection process, and we were talking about the interview. What were you looking for as far as, you know, when you were discussing and picking who would be the state poet? We were looking for someone who would fail the interview so it would be uphill. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Chuck. Well done. <laughs> Well, uh, among the things you're, you're, we're looking for is, 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 Matt just mentioned getting around the state. I think the interview committee is made up of a broad spectrum of people representing those three organizations and from around the state. And we're looking for uh, how many audiences do you think this person could engage with in, if, in a workshop or in a reading or in a visit to the community or whatever? And uh, you want someone who, who's not going to appeal to just one age group or one audience or one segment. You want someone who can broadly uh, go out and, and, and do poetry with people so it becomes a meaningful experience where they, where they are. And, and one of the things we thought with, uh, with the last state poet and with, with Matt as well was these are people who can work with many different audiences and, and get a response. Uh, uh, that we think is vital because this is a, this is a service job and it's wonderful to have a, an accomplished poet and an award-winning poet and a poet who's been recognized by other poets but in addition this position has to be somebody who can work with the broad range of of people to promote and 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 sell poetry mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that came across in in Matt's interview was that he was certainly the person to do that and and the other thing that comes across in the interviews is it's always a tight race to the finish i mean there's always competition for this there are always people we think would be very very good in the position and this was no exception this year there were two or three people who could have done an admirable job and and so it, i think it is something to say about matt or about twyla before him that, that they rose to the top of a very talented heap of people um any one of whom might have been selected, and, and it turned out we uh, think we did the right thing both times. Mm -hmm. I think it's great that we have such a deep, so many great poets in Nebraska. We really do. That it's, Absolutely. That there's too many to choose from. Yeah. <laughs> well, Nebraska is so rich in that. I mean, you look at the book Nebraska Presence, which we mm -hmm. mentioned, mm -hmm. or other uh, anthologies of Nebraska poets, including the one that just came out uh, for the 150th anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, it's there are so many amazing writers in this state. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, Matt, uh, you expressed uh, as part of your presentation uh, some goals for your time as a Nebraska State poet. And now that you've already gotten into doing some presentations and getting out, uh, uh, how do you think? Are those realistic in terms of what you set out to do? I hope so. Um, I, I mean, the I, I think definitely realistic in terms of I've already um, presented in about nine counties uh, in just the past few months. I've got you know more uh, things lined up to go to Alma and Holdridge and other parts of the state over the next uh, six months or so, um, mostly in the fall and fall semester. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of now figuring out with with my job, because I, ru I run a nonprofit, the Nebraska Writers Collective, and uh, it's full-time work. Uh, and also my wife is in grad school, and we have two kids. So there's, there's some logistics to figure out, but <laughs> uh, so I'm taking it a little slowly, I think this first year as I get it figured out. Well, slowly, but I still, I think I'll, I, I, You've been pretty productive. I've done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> quite a lot, actually. Yeah, uh, it's slower than I want because really, uh, this is the part of poetry that I love: is getting into communities, doing readings, talking to people. Mm -hmm. And my work has kept me busier and busier the past few years. It's what got me into nonprofit work, is I love going into schools 
in the last few years, uh, I haven't been able to do that nearly as much. Uh, so getting back out into communities like this has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, just you know, just did a reading on Saturday in Florence, the north end of Omaha, mm -hmm. at the Florence Mill, and you know everybody was expecting about 30 people, and instead there's probably about 80 people, oh, wow. and it's one of those audiences. That, I mean, a, a good poetry reading really needs a good audience. Um, uh, to mm -hmm. that's a bad. I guess Walt Whitman said, "Great, great poetry needs great audiences," or something like that, um, which I think is both readership and in the room. And when you've got great, a great energetic crowd in the room, mm -hmm. it's gonna be a good reading. Yeah. Um, I don't even have to do much, so. So how, how do those interested in inviting you to come to do a presentation, how do they go about doing that? How do they get in touch? Uh, they, uh, I'm easy to track down, uh, either through Humanities Nebraska or the Nebraska Arts Council, or directly, uh, I've got a website at matt.bidverse.com, or my um, email is mtmason at gmail.com. Anybody can get in touch with me, we can try to set something up, uh, and then the Humanities Nebraska and the Nebraska Arts Council help fund it. Uh, mm -hmm. so that I don't go broke driving around the state <laughs> in the next good. five years. Um, but libraries, communities, schools can apply for a grant, which is really easy to put together. Um, if anybody has questions, they can ask me. But contact me, and we can figure out some dates that would work. Work with right. local schools or libraries. Mm -hmm. I'd come out for a couple days and do multiple uh, events. I would love to um, just kind of go in and, uh, bring some bring some energy to poetry to wherever. You know. Yeah, when you say um, applying for a grant from no. Humanities Nebraska, it's really not a very scary process. No. It's a very easy speakers bureau <laughs> form. Yes. Um, yeah. Like you just fill out that yes, you've talked with Matt. This is what where it's going to happen. This is um, when it's going to happen. Um, and then you pay a fifty dollar application fee. But then we pay his honorarium and all of his travel, yeah. up to a point. Yeah. Like, <laughs> if you go point. all the way to Shadman, we might not be able to cover all that mileage. But he does get paid, so yeah. it's not all. Yeah, free. and I do <laughs> say it's a grant. I, you know, I run a nonprofit, so I know what grants can look like. The, these are basically a one-page. It's a one-page deal. So. That we help you with if you need help. Yeah, and that's <laughs> the thing. Uh, Humanities Nebraska and the Arts Council. If you have any questions, call them and they help you mm -hmm. fill it out. I can help you fill it out. It's it's pretty easy. Yeah, and here's the, the Humanities Nebraska page yeah. about submitting the grants. Um, and, and actually, that, that's um, for our grant system. That's more of many grants and major grants. If you go to um, it's a speakers, speakers Bureau. Ah, speakers yeah, you hit okay. Speakers yeah. and go down there. How to book a speaker page? Yeah, oh. would that be a place to start? Yeah, it's a good place to start, and that gives you the steps on how to do it. Mm -hmm. And as Matt said, it's a very you don't want to go into our mini grant major no, grant okay. process <laughs> because that's, that's, that's a, bigger than this. A, yes. And Matt's filled those out, so he knows. I have, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this will be to book a speaker through the Humanities mm -hmm. Nebraska. And then step three, you'll have that online application. There's that link there to log into our system and and um, access our Speakers Bureau applications. Right. And like you said, it was uh, $50 is all the... Yeah, $50 application fee. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then everything else is covered. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And then the programs I do are very general uh, so that they can be tailored to whatever your community needs most. Um, yeah. I come in and do a writing workshop of a specific sort. Uh, speak to a school group about certain topics or um, you know a certain curriculum that the teacher is looking at. Um, it's it's kind of uh, we we work together to figure out what will work uh, most effectively for your community. And now we also you also mentioned that the arts council has this is a whole different grant program. Yes. Yeah, if you want to go through the Arts Council instead of uh, Humanities Nebraska, you can also uh, go through their Arts Council. It's a very similar grant, uh, easy to fill out sheet, um, and similar uh, $50 uh, of the fee would be paid by the organization uh, and then the rest covered by the Arts Council. Mm -hmm. 
And, I, uh, and there, there are lower costs for, I think, uh, certain like low income. Oh schools yeah, and right. Because our fee, I think, goes down to thirty five dollars if it's a school, if it's a Title One school, mm -hmm. free and reduced lunch. Um, and that information is either on our website or you can call us at 402-474-2131 and talk with Liz Mikowski and she can get you that information. Yeah. But Matt, when you talk to the people who want to book you, do you talk about your different programs yeah. and whether or not they should apply through New Mines, Nebraska or the Nebraska Arts Council? Uh, for the most part, the distinction, I mean, I talk about what they want and then I, so far there hasn't been a, a distinction that needed either humanities or arts. They both covered both. Um, so yeah, I was wondering, I've which referred one, to both. Does it, what's the difference between, like, why would one you pick one or the other? Uh, yeah, I think it's, well, you you will know better working for Humanities Nebraska. What is Humanities Nebraska mm -hmm. looking for specifically? Well, what's Humanities, well, okay. I think one, it's one idea. speakers and... Um, yeah, it's more of a speakers, but you also do a lot of writing workshops, yeah. which also fall mm -hmm. under Humanities Nebraska, too. And as yeah. Those might also fall with the Nebraska Arts Council, do, but yeah. Nebraska Arts Council is more of a performance-related okay. uh, yeah. event. Yeah. So, I mean, the dis with poetry, I think the distinction is, I mean, there is a distinction, but I haven't mm -hmm. seen it necessary it's so because you're going to be performing your poetry yeah. and right. speaking about it. And that's course. the lovely thing about readings yeah. is because... It's not just the poet or the writer standing up and reading. There's always that interaction with the audience and questions afterwards, which mm -hmm. makes it both an arts event and a, and a humanities event. Yeah. yeah, and I think to a big extent what I try to do, whatever the program, is just make poetry accessible and entertaining for, for viewers um, just to get kind of dispel some of the myths that, Poetry is smarter than us or harder than um, any of us could ever figure out. Um, I think it certainly can be and it can be wonderful in that respect, but I think a, a lot of times in, in events like these, I just want people to understand poetry and think it's fun when they leave. Um, other questions you had, Rod? Or well, uh, the question about your uh, work with young people, you do writing exercises, but when you go to a school, what typically would you would you do there? Well, mostly in a school. What, what age groups do you work with? Are the whole elementary through high school, or is there a particular age group that you uh, I, work with? I've been, over the past couple of months, I've worked with K on up, um, which has been interesting, because I used to be hesitant to do kind of K through six because mm -hmm. uh, it's it tough. something little kids can really yeah, understand. It's tough. Yeah. I think the attention span is lower. Uh, you know, you go in, read a poem, and say, "Are there any questions?" And I saw a bunny. Um, <laughs> um, so I think in in the, in the past it's been much more difficult. But actually, going into I've gone into about four or five elementary schools over the past few months, and it's so much better than when I was not state poet. <laughs> uh, because now it's like I'm introduced as state poet oh. that like oh. raises something <laughs> the raises so bar. the kids listen better, <laughs> they ask more relevant questions. It's really weird. Um, you're like so a it's celebrity. Been you're, you're, you're a, a celebrity bit. they didn't know that existed. Exactly. That's a thing. So they've been a blast. So yeah, uh, I would, uh, might have been hesitant before to do some of the younger groups, but now it's like, sure. Um, but mostly what I do is I'll, I'll go in and I'll read some poems, ask, uh, answer questions, just talk a little bit about poetry and how I see it and ask them some questions about their own views of poetry or if they write or mm -hmm. anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not full on, I think Bill Clefcorn, previous state poets, who was state poet for about 35 years, would come into a room, he might read four poems in an hour, uh, mostly just be chatting and telling stories, and it was just absolutely riveting. Um, I'm not quite up to that. I'll try to read more than four poems, uh, a little less banter, but uh, 
yeah, it's it, it's mostly just kind of setting up an atmosphere that's fun for the audience, and and it differs audience to audience, kind of depending how they react and uh, all that. Yeah. yeah. I think that'd be a lot of fun for the kids, definitely. You said you got some interesting um, payments from some of Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have promised I will uh, do any school named after a poet. I will come out and do a presentation for a shirt or a sweatshirt. Uh, so, so far, I, I did that's after doing Nyhart Elementary in Omaha, mm -hmm. and they gave me a sweatshirt. It's like, yes, I got a, I got a John G. Nyhart sweatshirt. Um, I did a, another school for a box of tea uh, just recently. So, yeah, you don't have to go through Humanities Nebraska or the Arts Council yes. necessarily. Really. <laughs> if you've got other things that are worth worth you know uh, bringing some poetry out, uh, I will uh, I will come out for it. So. We'll work for tea. Yes. <laughs> tea yeah. and t-shirts. Yes. Because <laughs> I don't want to. Yeah, and I don't want anybody to feel limited. It's like, oh, I could never bring the state poets or this or just bring somebody whatever distance. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll figure out a way. Whether it's through one of these. Uh, funding opportunities or uh, just some other way. You know, maybe I can get something nearby and stop by your town on the way back to mm -hmm. home. Yeah, make a trip around state. So uh, I want to talk a little about, about maybe about your process of writing. Um, I don't know if you can, and this might be something that Brad could speak to as well, being you know, the a fellow poet about how you. And Chuck. Um, yeah, yeah and Chuck. that's right, yeah, Chuck too. Um, what do you, how do you, I mean, this might be something that people would ask you out there, like, the oh, definitely. potentially, you know, how do you come up with ideas, what's your inspiration for some of the things you've done? Yeah, a lot, well, I, I make myself write a new poem every week, so I've, uh -huh. I've got a deadline of Monday night, uh, where I have to have a new poem written, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't a lot, you know, I think Ted Kuzer would get up at 4 a.m. and write <laughs> every single morning, um, and that's why he's, as successful as he has <laughs> and as talented. Um, but uh, it's been a good kind of goal for me because, uh, you know, if you set a deadline and you treat it seriously, you're looking for things to write about all week. Whether you've got time in a given day to write a poem or not, you're looking for ideas and jotting down ideas. Um, because I think in, in any given day, there's probably five or six different moments where something catches your attention that could be a poem. Um, and most of the time, though, you know, 10 minutes later, we've forgotten what that was. <laughs> but if you're actively looking for things to write about, um, you know, you'll hopefully take a little bit more note and, and write about it. So um, I write by hand. I don't write on the computer myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I edit later, which is a whole nother step in the process, which helps me finish up poems and change them up really well. Because uh, one thing I've, I've kind of found, too, is that as a writer, I mean, I'm okay. I've got some good ideas. I do some things. It's exciting. But as an editor, that's my real strength. Mm -hmm. um, that's the first things I put down. They're all right. Um, but the, what really makes you know, the poems that I've had published or that have won awards are the poems that have really been worked on and edited slowly over over time usually. Mm -hmm. So yeah. But what about you, Brad and Chuck? Uh, tell us about your processes. Yeah. Brad, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I, I would I would echo what you say, Matt, about the the importance of just sort of. I like to say we're, we're I, mean, I have a practice of noticing, right? That we're trying to see what's around us that's worth writing down or holding on to. I like how you say that a deadline sort of forces you to actually do that and contain the things. Of late, I've been writing a lot of things down by hand, notebooks, carrying little notebooks in my pockets for those moments. Um, I was just having an interesting conversation with a, an, a fellow artist uh, slash designer um, this morning actually about the, the need for finding the right time you know, a lot of us feel like we have to, uh, the first, you know, first thing in the morning maybe has to be our, our writing time. So I'm, I'm excited to hear that you talk about your deadline being actually Monday night instead of, you know, noon on, on Monday morning or something like that. Because that's something that I find that I, I think we have this expectation that if it's our first priority, then it should be the first thing that we do. 
but then sometimes our minds uh, we have different stages of the day in which we're more more ready or more receptive to art and i often find that at the end of the day when i finally got all the to-do list done and all the emailing done is when my mind can kind of play and enjoy itself and, and do the writing at that time yeah well it's and, and yeah i used to write I, I had a kind of a system set of writing at home um and then with two kids that gets <laughs> altered <Yeah. laughs> Uh, so lately, I think the majority of my poems have been written at things like fast food restaurants. Uh, I was at the zoo the other day and I wrote two poems there. I, it, it's, it's kind of a little bit in tumult. So there is no, except for the Monday night deadline, there is no set anything for me, <laughs> right now at least. It changes year to year, I think. I think it's great when you that you can just do it when when the when the inspiration strikes, as long as your kids let you. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're writing poems too, right? Yeah, the oldest <laughs> is. Really? Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a poet at all because every time I write poetry, it turns into prose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fiction writer, and I find right. that the best time to write is I will when I'm driving and my mind is going. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're and not then writing I, I pull into a gas station, and I always have a notebook too because I write better with pen and paper. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in the gas station writing before I take off again. <laughs> you were saying, yeah. Fred, something about that about writing it. Oh, well, I was hoping that Erica wasn't writing while she was yeah. driving. <laughs> no, no, no. It's like when you're driving along, and suddenly this dialogue goes in your head. Mm -hmm. And so I'm paying attention to the trucks and stuff, but. <laughs> My students tell me that they do the same thing, and I always say, okay, I hope you're driving safely, but they are recording things into their phone and audio a lot. Right. I was wondering yeah. about that, if that's something for to have, like a hands-free device that you can just say, you know, phone, start recording, and then just start rattling off whatever the ideas are, or... Well, I think some sometimes... Poetry. Yeah. yeah. I, I think sometimes writing is, it's a pain in the butt in that, you have something like that where there was a time when in the car is when all the ideas would come or before that in the shower. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, <laughs> by the time you get out, all the lines are gone. Um, but in the car. And so I got a, crayons for your yeah, shower. I used to, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I used yes. to do that. Yes. Yeah. But I'm getting all these ideas in a car, in the car for a while. And then I got a voice recorder and I got a good one. And then they, it stopped as soon as I had the voice recorder. Yeah, that happens to me too because I used to use a recorder and yeah, it would it would stop. And so I just kind of rehearsed it in my head while I'm driving yes. along. Pull it off, so I'm not writing while I'm driving, Brad. I'm very safe. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting because it sounds like there's something to the creative process that needs a little bit of a limitation. Like, because I can't write it down right now, it must be precious. I really have to fight for it or something like that. Yeah. And sometimes I'm not not for everybody, I'm sure, and not all the time, but sometimes it's just frustrating. Like sometimes I, I remember walking, especially with my uh, firstborn, uh, you know, trying to get her to sleep, rocking her. And that's when the poems would come. And so <laughs> there are a lot of poems I wrote on the top of a dresser, on the back of a receipt with going like this, not rocking a baby. baby. No, no. So, yes. I like that that um, you have the poem, Matt. Um, when the baby falls, asleep, it's called "When the Baby Falls Asleep." We celebrate, and then I love it's a bleeding title. When the baby falls asleep, we celebrate silently. <laughs> <laughs> and that poem, I think, might have been written on the back of a receipt, actually. <laughs> Um, oh, speaking of, is there a certain, would you like to read some for us, sure. either that one or I sure. think the ones that you're... Uh, yeah, since Brad mentioned that, um, <laughs> won't leave people hanging. Um, so, when the baby falls asleep, we celebrate silently. My wife comes back into the light, arms high, and I jump up, making sure not to creak the chair. <laughs> We, and we exult. We take off our shoes and we dance. We are good people, shipwrecked on the shores of this strange island, fearing the drums far, far through the trees. We tiptoe quietly across the beach, TV quiet, as if all the world must whisper. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> must dare not wake her, must bow to this new pharaoh whose yokes we wear across our throats, this thunder infant with wrath grown into the fury and the pussiness that nursing at the breast can only sometimes abate. And if she then wakes, if the door creaks just so loud, if it's you who made the toilet seat crack like a gunshot, only moments after she went down and the woman who swore to love you forever looks you with all the flames of the underworld in her eyes. May God have mercy on you. <laughs> My wife and I rent nothing but horror movies now. Huddle next to the TV, try not to laugh out loud as these actors face aliens and disembowelments. Things we might have feared in another life, but let's see Freddy or Jason or King Kong make you fear like when you only mean to ease the door open, thinking how beautiful her little closed eye dream face is, and instead see her sit up, try not to scream. Her eyes rotate to snap on your mortal form. Oh ha, Godzilla, take a number, giant bug. This monster is so monstrous. We don't even try to run. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so that reading makes me wonder about the writing process that you guys are talking about writing things down and, and writing it. When you are composing a poem, is it actually part how someone will read it and part how you or someone will perform it? Because it's a little of both. I mean, someone else reading that may read it to themselves in a whole different voice. Yeah. In different yeah. parts of it. Um, do you think about when you're writing, or Brad and Chuck too, that how will this perform in addition to how it will be read? I mean, to an extent I do in that part of my editing process is really reading poems out loud um, exactly. and yeah. hearing... Yeah. Is the voice in my head and the voice on the paper the same voice that comes out into the air? And then try to adjust it with the line breaks and with the stanza breaks and all that so that hopefully another reader will get something close to that. But they're going to get something different. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's one of the. You want to try and lead them to what you were thinking of. Yeah. And have them be able to think of their own. Exactly. Have yeah, it means whatever it may, might mean to them. Yeah. I, which is fun because I, I think I, you know, occasionally, you know, in high school, they do forensics competitions where they memorize poems as part of a program mm -hmm. and recite them. And I've seen a few po uh, a few students do poems of mine completely differently, but in a really cool way. So mm -hmm. it's neat to see. But mm -hmm. what about you, Brad and Chuck? What do, what do you do with conversational or <laughs> the audience? The out loud portion is really important. And, and in, in teaching poetry, I think you teach kids to read them out loud. Uh, I'm I'm helping select some poems for a chapbook, and one of our guidelines is read the poem once silently and once out loud, so that you get that. I mean, it is sound after all. Yeah. Uh, really, uh, what I found in mind sometimes you write something and you think that's pretty good, and you read it out loud and you think that is that just isn't right at all. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I did the same thing when I was teaching literature, too, is tell kids, take take the Faulkner story into the corner where your neighbor won't think you're nuts and read it out loud to yourself uh, yeah. because it comes, off, it comes off really differently. I think that's uh, important. And, and the other thing is that just since I just mentioned it, good, good writing usually, I think, accompanies the work of people who are good readers. Yeah. If you're not reading anything, <laughs> it's unlikely you're going to write anything really good. <laughs> and the tradition of poetry is an oral tradition. I mean, I think originally folks, yeah, even even pre-literacy times, where the, we would hear somebody reciting a poem, and so it seems uh, mm -hmm. appropriate that we would always accompany our own writing with our own writing processes with, with writing with reading aloud rather. Yeah. So um, we talked about. Um, other poets in, in Nebraska and everything. Do you have any other particular poets who are influenced you in your writing, either Nebraskans or outside? Oh, uh, the, yeah, there a lot have. You know, I mentioned Bill Klepkorn earlier is a big influence on me. Um, actually, the biggest influence, though, is Sarah McKinstry Brown, who's my <laughs> wife. Uh, 
but she just had a second her second book came out the same basically week I was named state poet so our house has been a, a poetry mess uh, for months wonderful because she had a she's been touring and all but she's a fantastic writer and completely different than I am um, so I love I love getting her take on my own work um, at a point like early I used to show her earlier drafts but no uh, it's hard because she's a much better writer than I am so uh, but she's been fantastic uh, and then uh, man there, there's a lot of poets like Zadika Poindexter KDFS uh, uh, who kind of local that we did a lot we've done a lot of readings with uh, Stacy Waite uh, here in Lincoln at UNL is just absolutely amazing. Um, uh, there are a, a lot of fantastic writers uh, around the state and folks that I forget if he's from here, but Paul Zarziski who's a cowboy poet who I saw at Wayne State College years ago, um, who was really fascinating that he had these wonderful, you know, traditional cowboy form but also others that are completely different and just kind of the way he could meld those in a reading was a really good experience for me to see at that time. Uh, and then of course out there, J.B. Brummel's, uh, Twyla Hansen, of course, and, and Ted Kuzer. Yeah. You know? um, but yeah, that, I, I could sit here and name Nebraska poets probably <laughs> for the rest of this show. Um, yeah. Because there are just there are so many really fantastic and talented people in this state. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of those you can have join you in some of your oh, presentations yeah. as you're going around the next few years. Definitely. Yeah. Matt, could you also uh, tell us uh, a bit about your work uh, with slam poetry? And that goes back what early 2000s that you started getting involved with that? Or? Yeah, actually 1999. Mm -hmm. um, so slam poetry, for those who don't know, is a competitive form of performance poetry, or not really form, it's more a venue or an event style. Um, I kind of resisting to people say there is slam poetry, and there are poems that you'll see more often at slams. I've seen sonnets and haiku at poetry slams. So you can make knows? anything into it. Like how, it's exactly. how you perform it, I suppose. It's kind of, yeah. yeah. It, it's the way it's set up. But I, I love what Poetry Slam does in that it makes the audience the judge. So if you're going to read poems, you have to appeal to this audience. And so, you know, you're, everybody gets to read one poem, which is wonderful. And then some will read a second, and two or three will read a third if there are rounds of the slam. So it's a it's a competition that's not all that serious because you know where is this poetry slam taking place? They're often in bars or coffee shops where you know ten o'clock at night. How well are people chosen randomly for the audience going to judge <laughs> poetry? Uh, it was totally ludicrous, but it's fun. So uh, actually, I had, you know I published a fair amount. I had a master's degree before I even saw my first poetry slam, but from seeing that first one, I was just hooked because I love poetry that's lively and um, okay. stirs the audience uh, up a, a, a certain amount where they they can react. And I like that. I think poetry can be entertaining and should be entertaining and uh, in, you know, whether moving or just fun or who knows what else. And so I saw Poetry Slam in 1999 in Wayne State College. Uh, they invited me out as a judge. Uh, I think it was I think it was their first Poetry Slam officially, and they've done one every semester since 1999. Wow. Um, and it's a lot of fun. If you're ever up there for that in Wayne, it's worth going. <laughs> it's held in a bar. There's usually 30 poets competing, wow. uh, which is just ridiculous, but so much fun. Uh, <laughs> And so I ran a, a poetry slam in Omaha for about 12 years, and it's still running. Somebody else, uh, Greg Harries, now runs it second Saturday of every month. Um, and it's just a fun way of looking at poetry. And it was interesting, too, because nationally, when Poetry Slam came out of Chicago in the 80s, um, 
there was a lot of resistance from, I think, poetry critics, and Harold Bloom called it the death of art. Because <laughs> uh, he's a little drastic. A little drastic. <laughs> but I think what he failed to notice was that poetry is not one monolithic thing. It is a it is a whole multitude of genres and styles. And if we think poetry is just one thing, then we get a kid who doesn't like that one thing. They think they hate poetry. Uh, sure. The thing is, they don't like that one thing. Well, maybe they'll like slam poet, or maybe they'll like cowboy poetry, or maybe they'll like, uh, you know, haiku. Um, so it's uh, slam poetry fits in the world of one of the multitude of genres for poetry, and maybe you'll love it, maybe you'll hate it. But the thing is, nationally, there was a lot of grumbling about slam poetry in typically academic circles or whatever, but not in Nebraska. Um, here in Nebraska, I was running a poetry slam, and Marge Sizer, uh, you know, established poet here, would have me in for a reading, or Bill Clefcorn would ask me a question about poetry, or Chuck <laughs> Peake would have me talk to a class. Um, uh, Nebraska has always been just wonderfully welcoming in different styles of poetry, and I think that's that's part of the reason why Nebraska has so many fantastic poets, is that we're, we want to see what's next. We want to see uh, John Keats, and we want to see you know the the latest uh, sensation. So, um, yeah, one one new thing being created does not negate all the other styles. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why yeah. they think, oh, it's ruined it all. <laughs> <laughs> Let it be its thing, and everything else can be its thing too, and it all works out. Yeah. It does. It does. Um, one, thing, uh, go ahead. One, one thing it seems to me is really an advantage when you're in Omaha or Lincoln, you have other nearby writers and you often work as a group. Uh, I know uh, Marge Sizer that you mentioned and Lucy Atkins and uh, Amy Pletner uh, meet together and uh, I think somehow that working together dispels in your mind that there's just one thing that's poetry. Mm -hmm because you're seeing other people do good work that's not like the work you do. And that's harder to get out past anywhere west of Garland, um, where the population is a little thinner. And, and I'm hoping that, uh, I know Twyla worked on this, and I know you will, Matt, that, that somehow the work of the state poet can help bring the writing community closer together and have more contact with each other. Yeah. I was, yeah, I, I was point. thinking about that with Brad. You're actually based in, at UNK in Kearney, right? Of uh, you know, farther west than what Chuck was talking about. How is the um, community there? Well, I, I of course we're smaller than we are in Omaha or, or Lincoln, but we're there. We're existing. Uh, a lot of connection to the university. Um, Chuck's mm -hmm. there, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we we have. Um, uh, we have the Reynolds Endowed um, writing series through the university, which we, we bring in writers from all over the country. We had two from Brooklyn this past semester, Nicole Seeley and Paul Lisicki. Um, so we are able to bring in people. There's another, uh, the Front Porch reading series, which brings in people from just around the state of Nebraska, which is how Steve Coughlin was just at our school, as we were talking about before. So there are these events that are happening, and then there's communities that form, I think, around those events and continue on. Um, we have that connection to the to the university that serves us well. In a in a larger city, the university can have its its impact, but there's a different impact that a university can have in a smaller town, a different sort of visibility and presence, right? And so I think that we are are good at taking advantage of that. Um, and then there, there's an enthusiasm. I feel like this is my first year um, at UNK, but I feel this this excitement for poetry and for literature. My students were just telling me at my um, students from my advanced poetry class, as well as my intro to creative writing. I had multiple students come up to me on their own and say, I want to keep writing over the summer. How can I start a writing group? And so they're yeah. starting this together. I'm helping with that. We're doing things electronically for those who are away. But there is there is an energy there, I think, of um, which speaks to the importance of literature in our lives. I guess that people won't, just really want to have it, aside from when it's homework, or even aside from when it's easy to create that community. Well, and Brad, you're doing some things over the summer around the state. Uh, uh, you were yeah. telling me about it before. Uh, tell us, uh, I'd love to hear more about that, uh, those workshops or that series that you're doing. Yeah, um, 
in June, I'll be part of the Storycatcher Writers Festival, which is um, hosted by the Marie Sandos uh, Foundation as well as Shadron State, and it's at Fort Robinson. So it's a three-day thing. People are coming in from to participate from from across the nation. Uh, there will be three faculty members leading workshops. I'm one. Um, Frank X. Walker, Walker is another um, as, as a poet, uh, and then we also have a prose writer. And so uh, people are coming in to go cram into Fort Robinson and sleep in bunk beds and celebrate poetry and write their own and um, have their work workshops and create this little community, sort of pop-up community uh, for that time. Um, it's an annual event. I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it now and I'm, I'll be curious how it continues in the future. This is, um, I want to say maybe the eighth year that they've done it, but I'm not sure. That's cool. It's just, just for just for fun, I, we were out buying a tree the other day, and the gal that sold us the tree happened to mention that she was she was a short story writer, and had just had a story published. And so, oh, wow. I, I immediately got hold of the people out of McCook at the Buffalo Common Storytelling Festival and said, mm -hmm. this, "This gal's about to go off to Missoula to do her MFA. Maybe you'd like to have her come read before she leaves." <laughs> She's scheduled for the Saturday night program for this year's Buffalo Common Storytelling Festival. So the more you can bring those people together, the more fun it is. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, and there are things like this around the state with Buffalo Commons, with Story Catcher, uh, other things down at the Cather Center and, and others around the state. I think, you know, a lot is happening in Omaha and Lincoln, obviously, but um, it's yes, really yeah. fantastic to see what's happening literarily. That's not a word, is it? <laughs> Around the state, we'll say. If a poet says it's a word, then it's a word. Yes. <laughs> I have two English degrees. I will use them. You have the power, yes, to create language now. Um, Shakespeare did, why not hey. that face? <laughs> why not? Sure. Um, if anybody else on the line has any questions, any of your audience, um, go ahead. I, nobody's typed anything yet. We've been chatting away here, but um, feel free if you want to ask something or if yeah. you um, want to know about more about any of the programs or things that are going on yeah. across the state. Um, do you have another poem you might like to uh, share? Sure. Something else? Uh, in before you... Talking about uh, poems as entertainment, there's another form of entertainment which kind of gets the headlines more in Nebraska. So uh, this poem is called After the 1996 Fiesta Bowl. <laughs> well, some things happened around Nebraska when <laughs> the, some local football team won a big game. In, you know. <laughs> One guy jumps out of a car and strips to red briefs, swinging his pants around his head and howling. The face-painted guys jump off the pickup to trade high fives in traffic. A champagne bottle gets handed out a Buick window, horns a honking, red people running around cars and steaming on a January midnight. Cops on horseback wade through the red flags. Above, even the sh hooting wildheads riding on someone's shoulders like big ass Jesus on St. Christopher's back brain, go big red, <laughs> with a few thousand of their closest buds. Cops guard the traffic signs so they won't become souvenirs. Some lean against squad cars, kind of smiling, some visibly tired and on overtime. We scream and flow, take pictures, hug, throw beer cans, climb light poles, slap hands, greet grunt, and though we are Nebraskans and still keep most of our clothes on, <laughs> we do think wildly that if all of Omaha gets naked, what are they going to do? <laughs> My fingers stiffen like garden hose, but we all keep slapping and celebrating throats raw because we darn well can, and no one's going to be on time to work in the morning anyway. Woo when I was a kid, I didn't dream about writing poems. I wanted to play I back for the Huskers. Now I'm a lot older, more experienced, and I still have four years of eligibility left. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of people in the state have that same thought. <laughs> I still have a chance. <laughs> Never know. You, you know just just remember that 
Matt fills a spot that has a great heritage, not only in the wonderful Bill Clefgorn, uh, but before that with John Nyhart. And this was the first state to have by legislative action a state poet. We called it the Poet Laureate then. Uh, but the legislature brought that into being because of Nyhart's cycle of the West. And so if you fill Matt's shoes, you're filling the shoes of, of a long heritage of people who uh, made a name in this room and really brought both enlightenment and entertainment to people through their poetry. And, and Matt's just a perfect choice to follow up on that. Well, thank you, Chuck. Uh, we do have a, um, some questions, comments that came in uh, from the audience here. Um, Person wants to know if you are a member of the Nebraska Writers Guild. Um, I am. I'm not. I do some things with them occasionally. I'm not. I'm not a member right now, though. Uh, mm -hmm. But they do uh, really wonderful work, especially supporting writers. I refer mm -hmm. people to them a lot who uh, are looking for different writing opportunities. So mm -hmm. well worth Another. well worth checking out. Um, and then just I uh, just want to compliment Matt on um, L Tab Great Plains. It was my first experience of slam poetry. I didn't expect to like it so much. <laughs> and then she also says, full disclosure, my kid's team made it to the final. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. But I'm sure she enjoyed it anyway. It's in there. <laughs> yeah. That's a L tab is louder than a bomb. It's a yes. high school uh, slam poetry where teams, schools compete against schools with their poems in performance. It's run by the Nebraska Writers Collective, and it's so much fun. Yeah. Um, I, it's. It culminates in a festival in the spring, but I think the real heart of it is it's a school year round program where kids are writing from the start of the school year. Mm. And it's just amazing to see. I, well, it's intimidating to see because uh, pretty much all of them end up writing better poems than I did in high school. So <laughs> um, it's really fun to watch. Yeah. And someone says they hope look forward to attending one of your programs someday. We got five years Great. coming up. Well, <laughs> things beyond this five what years. What community are they in? Uh, Claudette, where are you from, Claudette? Uh, it's all right. Well, you know how to bring me out. Uh, we've talked about it earlier in the program. Um, if you can't do it personally, talk to your local library, talk oh, to yeah, the oh, school. Yeah, She's in Nebraska City. Okay. Oh, that's yeah, not too far. Yeah. There's a lot of places down there that hopefully uh, will get me down there. Yeah. Oh, and one of our staff, and I'm not sure who, let's see if this is... Uh, uh, I think it might be Amy says, thanks, bravo, thanks for serving Nebraska with poetry. You made me like poetry. <laughs> one, of our, <laughs> one of our staff here, yes, is saying, we've got our staff watching. Oh, thank you. Good job. Very interesting. All right. Um, all right, so we are a little after 11 o'clock here. Um, anybody have any last minute questions they want to ask before we do wrap things up? Um, or um, comments, type them in. Um, any uh, final words from all of you, Jeff or Brad? Thanks, Matt, for being the state poet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Brad. Uh, thanks for really bringing a lot of energy out to uh, the Reynolds Chair and Carney. Uh, I'm excited to see what you get done because you, you, it's a five year term, also, right? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. And, and to Brad, if you need any money for public okay, programs yes. with poetry, okay. I'm listening. talk to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. Well, and Krista, thanks to the Library Commission and Humanities Nebraska and the Arts Council, or this wouldn't all be taking place. And the recognition that you can have all the talent in the world if you don't have audiences, it doesn't do very much. So you guys make that possible. Absolutely. Thank you. We, we are here for it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and that's another thing that I end up talking about. You know, people ask me, how do you become a state poet? And I talk about, oh, the Nebraska Library Commission, the Arts Council, Humanities Nebraska. And it's just, uh, we're very fortunate to have all the, these organizations and others who are working with, you know, literacy, the humanities, the arts, uh, poetry woo, uh, <laughs> in this state. And Rex Walton and Mo Java. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's true. A lot of smaller, uh, they're not organizations, but they're organizers. There's a lot of them working uh, around the state, putting on events and uh, not getting all, a, a lot of attention. So, yay, Rex. Yay, Greg Harris. Yay, all the people running an, an open mic attended by five people once a month. Yeah. 
know, it's it helps. Every bit, every yeah, it, it's all important. Yeah, yeah. You get, if you get the right person's ear and get them to continue with it or want to become a poet themselves or whatever, yeah. absolutely. That's it. All right. Well, doesn't look like anybody has any desperate questions or comments right now, and that's oh. fine. Um, reach out to Nebraska Humanities Arts Council, Matt. Give your email address again. Yeah, mtmason at gmail.com. Yep, and nice. if you Google Matt Mason poet, I should be one of the top. There's a lot of Matt Masons, but there not is. so many I, Matt I Mason I made that poets. mistake. I figured, oh, Matt Mason. I'm here in Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, no. No, there's <laughs> a lot. Sure, yeah, look for the poet. A lot of really successful writers as Matt Mason that I've run, I've run across. Or mm -hmm. musicians also. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of them is playing at the Maha Festival this year. He's got an E in Mason, though. But, ah, okay. Yeah. But, yes, you definitely find him now, especially with all the state poets. Yeah. So um, look for him in your community. Bring him to your communities. Talk to your school. Partner with your school. Partner with your library. Um, any other arts yeah. group in your area. Um, and help meet Matt's goal of visiting every single county. Yeah. Nine down, 80. <laughs> Four to go. <laughs> We're just getting started. <laughs> awesome. So I think that'll wrap up today. Thank you so much, Brad. This is great well, having, having you me. here and Erica and Brad and Chuck online and yeah. and thanks, Jesse, Brad. You, thanks, Chuck. Yeah, you made it down the end. Just yeah. Um to join you. Yeah. So I am going to let's see, where is my page here? There we go. Um <laughs> Hop over here to our main page. Um, yes, yeah, so we have been recording the show today, and it will be posted onto our um, website. If you, um, so far in the world, if you use your search engine of choice, whatever you want to do, and type in Encompass Live, we are the only thing called that on the internet so far. Yay! <laughs> Nobody else can do that, call themselves that. Um, but this is our main Encompass Live website, and our recording will be, our, these are upcoming shows, but our archives are right here underneath, and um, they're just uh, most recent ones at the top, so today's will be right here at the top of the list. Should have it as long as the um, we post it to the Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube channel, so everyone out there can watch it. Um, as long as everything cooperates with me, should be ready by the end of the day today. Um, all of you who attended and registered will get notified of when it's available. We also push it out to our social media. We do have a uh, Facebook page for Encompass Live, and we use Twitter, Facebook for the Library Commission. Um, but while we're here on the archive, I do want to show you, you'll see here, we do have a search feature for it where you can search our entire archives of the show or just the most recent 12 months. Um, that is because Encompass Live premiered in January 2009, so we are in our <laughs> 11th year. Is that what this is? Yeah. It's it's huge. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a lot. I don't know how many is on here off the top of my head, but um we are librarians and we archive things. That's what we save things. So we do have all of our shows here, huh? So if you go here and if you do scroll down far enough, you will see shows from previous years. Um, but everything is dated. So if you are watching a show, do pay attention to whatever the date is. If it's something from 2010, 11, 12, things might not exist anymore. Resources might not be there. Links may be broken to, to outside services. But um, we will keep them all there for historical purposes. So um, um, do your searches in there and look at some of our um, previous shows if you want to. Um, as mentioned, we do have a Facebook page, which we are big on Facebook. Using that, you can uh, give us a like over there. There's a reminder to log into today's show with Matt. Um, we do post, ah, I just need to click on that. Um, we do toast reminders of here of when our shows are coming up, when our, our recordings are ready, uh, when um, anything is available here. So um, if you do like to use Facebook, no, I don't want to log in right now, thank you. Um, we um, have all of those on here, so give us a like over on Facebook. So I hope you join us for a next week's show when we talk about picture books. Um, one of our libraries here in Nebraska, Keenan Moore Library in Fremont, they um, reorganized their picture book collection. And Laura England Biggs is a librarian from there. She's going to be with us to talk about how they redid everything in their um, kids' picture books. So definitely sign up for that show and any of our others we have on our calendar. See, I've got May filled in. I'm filling in dates for the summer. As you can see, I've got started with some of those. So keep an eye on our schedule to see what else comes up over the next few months. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And I hopefully we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.